Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. We had quite a number that they presented at a qualifying district event in uh, Virginia. And the purpose of the event is if you are passed on with a superior with invitation, you're invited to go to the national festival each summer. So f this year it's in Columbus, Ohio. And we had 48 entries that moved on to the national convention, including 16 teams and over 30 solos. It's really incredible, though. I have to say that we um, count success as a successful process, and we talk about that a lot within the fine arts ministry, that uh, we want to have a good product but it's how you get from point A to point B that matters, especially in a discipleship ministry. So, for instance, are the kids speaking in love to one another? Are they encouraging each other? Are they listening to their coaches? Um, are they displaying godly character? And that's really what's important to us. And I could tell you that our kids really are, and that's the part that makes them winners, because we, um, we're not about, we're not American Idol, we're not The Voice, we're not about making stars like that. You know, our, for us, our kids are stars when they shine for Jesus. It's about him. <clears throat> and uh, I, I get that. I get wanting to be a star. Uh, I wanted to be famous when I was a kid. My two best friends, uh, Darren and Eric, they wanted to be famous. So the three of us, uh, we grew up in a small town. It was mostly Jewish. And we would uh, meet often at the haagen or the Hebrew National Deli and get our kosher hot dogs and sit down and dream about what life would be like after college and how we would all meet up together and go to New York. And so um, that was the plan. And then God threw a wrench in that plan when he saved me. And so praise God for that. But, um, but then my trajectory of my life changed as well. So um, we, I, I ended up going to school in upstate New York in a small school called Oswego. And uh, we joked that it was more cows there than people. And um, ended up meeting my wife. And that's where we stayed up in that area, up in towards Syracuse, until six years ago when I moved here. But I've always been involved in ministry. And I started serving in the church when I was 18. I started uh, conducting a choir. And I also started directing shows when I was 18. And, um, and so at that time, everyone in my ministry was older than I was, and, uh, which was an a unusual uh, circumstance. And then over time, they caught up, and we were all kind of the same age. And uh, that brings me to today, where almost everyone is younger than I am. So uh, it's been 42 years of serving the Lord. Uh, all throughout the generations. And so the message I'm going to share today is something that's really on my heart. And uh, uh, I'm going to get into it right now. Let's pray first, and then we'll hit the scriptures. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to belong to a church that loves the generations, Father, and, and is um, invested in our youth, Lord God. And uh, from, the, from their birth on, Lord God, uh, this is a place that uh, cherishes our responsibility to the young, Father. And, and Lord God, I ask you to continue to bless the ministry here and that um, our young folks would know that we stand behind them, that we love them, and that we're pulling for them. And God, that um, we would continue to feed them the word of God so that when they grow from this place or as they grow up, Lord God, they would have the foundation they need to live a godly life in you. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So um, I was thinking a lot this week about, um, about baby dedications. And uh, I love baby dedications. I love when young moms and dads come up here and... Um, you know, they're seeking God humbly for help in raising a child. And if you're a Christian who's raised uh, kids, you know that you need God's help to raise godly kids. Amen? And so um, I, I love how everyone stands up. And in most churches, we put our hands out, we pray. 
for, um, for these families. And in a way, by standing up, we're also making a commitment to these families that we're going to stand with them and help in the raising of their kids, and especially in the spiritual dynamic of making sure that we could do all we can to encourage them with their walk in the Lord. And the reason we do that is because God, when we say that we are the family, family of God, he doesn't want us to just look at it as a metaphor. He really wants us to see the family of God as our family. And he wants our kids to see that. When I got saved, my parents uh, didn't believe, you know, as a Jewish boy, they didn't believe it was actually happening. They thought it was a fad. You know, and then I went to school about a year and a half later. I came home for Thanksgiving, and they realized that um, it wasn't a fad. And so they cut me off at that point. And... Um, and the family of Christ, the family of God really became my family. You know, I remember spending my first Christmas uh, with a family from church. And uh, I grew up, again, Jewish. We had a decent amount of money, and so there was lots of gifts. And uh, so when this family invited me over, they said they had a gift for me, and I was all excited. And uh, I remember just wondering what it was and having dreams of what it could be. And... Uh, and I opened it up, and it was a pair of uh, fluorescent blue socks. <laughs> and um, I said, thank you so much, as I was crying inside, you know, just so sad and wondering, what, what have I just done? But, um, but the truth is that I love the body of Christ. And as someone who didn't grow up in it but needed it, um, it really wasn't a metaphor for me. It was actually the body. It was my family. And uh, I think that God really wants us to see the church as our family and wants our kids to feel safe here. And one of the things I love about directing uh, fine arts is the kids feel so at home in this place. Um, sometimes they're too much at home. Um, they, they run around and eat all over the place and whatever, but I love it that they feel like this is a home you know, and that they're comfortable here, and that they're comfortable with you. It's a precious thing. And for those of us with kids, younger kids, you know, to have them grow up amid, uh, among such loving people, it's precious. Uh, let's look at our first scripture, Mark 10, 13 through 16. I'm using the Message Bible because I love the translation of this, but uh, it's Mark 10, 13 through 16. It says, the people brought children to Jesus, hoping he might touch them. The disciples shooed them off, but Jesus was irate and let them know it. He says, don't push these children away. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. Mark this, unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of its child, you'll never get in. Then gathering the children in his arms, he laid his hands of blessing on them. Now he was furious that when he said, don't ever get, let the, uh, don't ever get between me and the kids. You know, and I, when I read that, I kind of had a, a chill up my spine. And, and I thought, gee, Lord, I hope I, I, I don't do anything at this point. You know, my kids are older, but I would do anything that would ever get in the way of what you want to do with my kids. And also with the kids that I work with. And I know that your heart as well, that we would never do anything but, uh, but point our kids to Jesus. You know, and it says that Jesus, that these children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. So if this is true, then we need to train our younger saints how to stay in the center of God's will. 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 3 is our next scripture, also from the uh, Message Bible. It's 1 Samuel 3, and at what's happening here is that Samuel has been left at the temple. His parents have left him as a sacrifice, way of saying thanks to God for this child. And uh, you have Eli, who's uh, teaching him, overlooking uh, his life, mentoring him. And um, one night, it picks up in uh, verse 1, the boy Samuel was serving God under Eli's direction. This was at a time when the revelation of God was rarely heard or seen. One night, Eli was sound asleep. His eyesight was very bad. He could hardly see. It was well before dawn. The sanctuary lamp was still burning. 
Samuel was still in bed in the temple of God where the chest of God rested. Verse four, then God called out Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, yes, I'm here. Then he ran to Eli saying, I heard you call, here I am. Eli said, I didn't call you, go back to bed. And so he did. Six and seven, God called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli. I heard you call, here I am. Again, Eli said, son, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. This all happened before Samuel knew God for himself. It was before the revelation of God had been given to him personally. God called again, Samuel, the third time. Yet again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Yes, I heard you call me. Here I am. That's when it dawned on Eli that God was calling the boy. So Eli directed Samuel, go back and lie down. If the voice calls again, say, speak, God. I'm your servant, ready to listen. Samuel returned to his bed. Then God came and stood before him exactly as before, calling out, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, speak. I'm your servant, ready to listen. I think the first thing to catch here is that Eli kept sending Samuel back to bed, even though he was hearing from God. And I think one of the encouragements of this passage is that when your kids hear the voice of God, don't, don't dismiss it. Encourage it. Encourage them and, and let them believe that they are called. I think it's our prayer, isn't it, that when our kids are young, they would come to know Jesus. And so um, we, want to, we want to point them again. Don't push them back to bed. Point them to God. And one of the interesting things about this passage is you kind of have three players here. You have God, you have Eli, you have Samuel. And God could have just kind of cut Eli out of the whole thing and just shared with Samuel um, what his plan was and why he was calling him. But instead, he kept having the boy being directed back to Eli, which if you know the passage is ironic because the whole reason that God wanted to speak to Eli was to cast judgment on Samuel, or back, I'm sorry, backwards. He wanted to speak to Samuel to cast judgment on Eli and his sons. And, uh, but yet, he still uses Eli, even, uh, even though God had strong feelings towards him about the kind of dad he was and, and the problems that his sons were causing in the kingdom, he still went through Eli. He still wanted this older man to instruct and to lead the young Samuel. And it's kind of the same thing with, um, with David and Timothy. Uh, if you look at uh, 1 Timothy 4.12, basically what you have here is a faithful young man, Timothy, who is looking to Paul for leadership and confidence and confirmation because he's preaching amongst a lot of older folks who some of them are having a hard time being taught by this younger man. And so Paul says in 1 Timothy 4.12, he says, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Now, Paul was not just telling him this, but he was also living these things out for Timothy. So he was helping Timothy to see how he was to live his life, but he was also encouraging him to live it in such a way that people can look to him and he would be um, blameless and be able to set an example for them to follow. But sometimes there is a problem with the generations working with one another. And, and that is that you have the older generation that sometimes has difficulty with the way the younger generation does things and says things. And then you have a younger generation who sometimes feels like it's time for the older folks to move on and give us our chance. And, um, and so I, 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 God directed me to David and Goliath, which I thought was an unusual place to go, but it made sense to me when I, once I got there. So uh, we're going to pick it up in 1 Samuel 17. And 
the uh, thing that's interesting here is before where we pick it up uh, took place, there were a couple of chapters where there's this building up of there's going to be a conflict between the Philistines and Israelites, and uh, the brothers have gone to fight. Um, you have David who wants to go and fight, and uh, the brothers are like, you can't go, you're too young. And uh, the dad said, you can't go, you're too young. Uh, he goes anyway. And um, he gets there. His brothers are furious at him. Everyone is looking down at him because of his youth. And, uh, and so we're going to pick it up from there. So 1 Samuel 17 at verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. And he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And I, when I read this, I thought, um, so how does this apply? And, and I, I kind of get this picture of Goliath being kind of like how the older generation could, could sometimes be, where we're kind of, we have this traditional way of doing things. You know, back then, there was a way, there was protocol in fighting. You know, you'd have your strongest man come out, and he had his shield bearer, and the other side's strongest man would come out, and they would face each other. And so, there was a pride in Goliath that I'm going to come and I'm going to face their strongest man and I'm going to take care of him. And so he comes on out and he looks and, you know, he has to look down to see this guy. And there's this little boy who's handsome and cute, but not a warrior. And, uh, and instead of having a shield bearer and, and uh, a sword and spear, he has rocks and a stick. And uh, because he was a, a shepherd. And so... Um, you can see that sometimes when we're older, we, we can be stuck in our ways and see things a certain way and maybe not so open to change. Uh, but then you, you could also see how, as David ran in, though he probably did not mean any disrespect other than the fact that he was going to take down the giant, he, he was still perceived that way that he was being disrespectful, even though that wasn't the case. And um, the, with my friends, uh, me included, in the older generation, you know, I want to remind you that we were just the same way when we were younger. I mean, you think about it. When you were 21, 22 years of age, you know that time when we, we finally learned everything we ever needed to know? And, um, and at the same time, we realized that our parents didn't know anything, you remember that time? And uh, the only thing that changed was that life has a way of humbling us, and certainly the Lord does too. And, and we learned that uh, maybe we're not as smart as we thought, and maybe our parents aren't as dumb as we thought. Maybe they actually know something, you know, believe it or not. And, uh, and you know, uh, this is... Young ones, when you're in your 20s, you think you know everything. And then you become, you get, you're in your 30s. And then you realize when you were in your 20s, you didn't know anything. And then when you're in your 40s, you look back in your 30s, and you still realize you didn't know anything. And that's kind of how life goes. You know, Job 12.12 it's, Job 12 says, with old age is wisdom, and with length of days is understanding. You know, you may be surprised, too, if you talk to some of the older folks around here, just how much wisdom and how much they, uh, um, knowledge they have. Um, and you know what? Their attitude is not that they're somehow so great and you're not. That's not their motivation. The motivation of the older generation towards the youngest one is that we have learned a lot, especially from our mistakes. And our heart is that you don't make those same mistakes. And so we try to share our wisdom with you. A lot of times, wisdom that came from doing things wrong so that we could spare you that um, chance to do it wrong yourself. And uh, there's a scripture that says, uh, a word to the wise is sufficient. And that means that if there's a fire, you could tell someone who's wise, don't touch the fire, and they don't get burned. 
Um, but a fool has to go and touch the fire. Now, a lot of us have been that fool, I, I myself included, where we had to go and we had to find out for ourselves that that thing was dangerous. But our heart, as an old, older folks, our heart is that we can impart wisdom to you so you don't make those same mistakes. And, uh, and that is our heart. Um, Proverbs 20, 29 says, the glory of youth is their strength, uh, but the beauty of the age is their gray hair. First of all, let me just say that those of us who have aged, um, we may not have the fight anymore. And we know that the word says that the battles, the fight, you know, it's kind of with the young men and women, you know, that they have the vigor and, and the strength to do those kind of things. I think the older generation kind of moves to a different place where we become mentors, we become encouragers, we become teachers. We, we, we let them know that we're behind them, uh, not looking down at them. Um, but the beauty of the age is our gray hair which means I must be beautiful, you know? Um, it's funny because I remember, I remember growing up, and uh, I grew up in the 70s, so everything was big hair. So I, I had big, black, beautiful hair and thick hair. And how do I know that? Because every time I got my hair cut, the lady would say, oh, you have such beautiful black hair. And, uh, and then after a while, the thick part kind of fell out, you know? And then it was like, you have black hair. And, then it was, you have hair. And now they just look at me with sadness in their eyes. Uh, but, you know, I, I've learned to love my gray hair because um, it, it's a representation for me of what God has done in my life over the years. And, uh, and I could tell you that my gray hair reminds me of God's faithfulness. And... <clears throat> I don't think, uh, in those who are my age, I don't think uh, the younger ones could just understand why we're so thankful. And it's because we've just had years and years of seeing God's faithfulness in our lives. And so, um, let's look at another scripture, Psalm 71, 17 through 18. It says, oh God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things you do. Now that I'm old and gray, do not abandon me, O oh God. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, your mighty miracles to all who come after me. So here was a, a psalmist who uh, had the fortune, good fortune of being exposed to the gospel from his childhood. And when I was reading this, I was thinking about Chris Seals, uh, who started all the good news clubs here in Dover. And... Um, and is doing great work uh, presenting the gospel to young children. And a lot of our older members have gone to work with this, with this group, and they're having the chance to, to preach the gospel to young kids and seeing them get saved. And uh, a lot of them are, are having their strength renewed and uh, their youthfulness restored. And let me tell you, if you want to stay young, hang with the young people and walk beside them, listen to them, encourage them to have courage, support their efforts, and holding up their arms by convincing them that God is with them and that he backs their play. I can tell you that my wife and I, I, I just turned 60 a couple of weeks ago, my wife is 63, we love uh, hanging with the young adults. Um, they're definitely different, <laughs> but we, we love them and um, we love the potential that is in them. And, uh, and they do make us feel young. And if you, old age can make you feel either pitiful or beautiful, okay? It's pitiful when our pessimism discourages the enthusiasm of the youth. But it's beautiful when our witness encourages the visions and dreams of the young. But for this to happen, some of us may have to change the way we look at younger folks. You know, I see these kids in fine arts, and I see some of our young adults around here. I've watched the last six years, a lot of them become, uh, turn from teenagers to young adults. And I'm excited about the future. You know, at first I wasn't so. Uh, I was worried, but 
um, I have faith in God for them, and, and I'm seeing that they have a heart for God. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I think God is going to do great things with our young adults and with our teens. So let me just uh, close with saying this to my older friends. God is not done with you, and there's no such thing as spiritual retirement. You'll have eternity. You'll have eternity to rest, and that should be enough time to rest. So keep going. Some of you may be thinking, but I'm not relevant anymore. That's not true. I've had those feelings myself, but there, we do have relevance in what we have to offer these um, younger folks. And I'm going to tell you a couple of ways you could be relevant right off the bat. Some of our families here, they don't have dads and moms and grandparents in their lives. And it would be a beautiful thing for you to step in and become those kind of spiritual parents and grandparents to them. Some of our families here are military folks whose families are far away. Um, this is something uh, that Teresa and I try to do um, uh, with families around here that we know. And, and we do that because it happened to us. Uh, my parents were not really involved with my kids and my wife's mom passed away. And so when my kids were old enough, uh, like five or six, to understand the whole grandparent thing, uh, one day we found out that they were walking around church going, are you my grandma? Are you my grandpa? And uh, yeah, it was super sad, but they're okay. Um, <laughs> but there was this couple, Dee and Larry Liptak, and um, they said, yes, we'll be your grandma and grandpa. And, and from that moment on, they became like grandparents to my kids. And we would go over to eat. We would spend time with them. They would babysit our kids. And, and uh, they would um, even keep them overnight. And, uh, and there's a couple of ways that you can really reach out to, and become relevant. Now, let me tell you, too, by the way, uh, when we ha used to have to hire babysitters, we paid, what, a dollar, two dollars an hour? They're paying $15 an hour now for a babysitter, okay? 13-year-olds are getting $15 an hour. So it's like $60 just to get four hours of babysitting. That doesn't even cover dinner and a movie. Uh, and so this is a way that you can meet a practical need, but it also opens the door for you to have the opportunity to minister and to share with other families. We, we have a family like that. We have a, a few families here in the church that we have that kind of relationship with. One of them is a military family, and uh, they have a couple of little girls. One is three years old, and uh, she calls me Grandpa Larry, uh, and she calls uh, my wife uh, Grandma Larry. And... Uh, <laughs> So she doesn't quite get how that works. But um, we, spend, we spend time with them. We go out for ice cream all the time. We've had them over for dinner. We've taken them out. Um, we've watched their kids. And, um, and they're going to leave in a couple of months, um, which is sad and breaking our hearts. But um, at least we got to love on them and give them a sense of family while they were here. And uh, we don't know if those little girls are going to remember who we are. But what we do hope is they remember that they were loved. And, uh, and they'll think fondly back on this place as well. And so um, you have the opportunity to lead that kind of legacy. And there's a lot to be said about legacy. You know, when I talked about my friend's... Um, Darren and Eric in the beginning of the service. And my friend Eric is the only person in history to win the Director's Award for the Sundan uh, Sundance Film Festival twice. Um, my friend um, Darren went to Broadway, played on Broadway, directed Pitts, has traveled all over the world um, with musicians. And um, I'm here, so you can figure out that I didn't become famous. <laughs> Uh, but over the course of 40 years of working with kids, God did give me a legacy. And I'm really grateful for that. And uh, when I think about that, I think about Pastor John next door. And uh, about five years ago, Pastor John and I went to um, the Chinese restaurant that used to be over at Rodney Village. It was really good until it got condemned and closed. But, um, <laughs> but we loved it. It's like a second office for us. And um, we were there one day and we heard, we heard um, 
some little girl uh, scream, uh, Pastor John, Pastor John, and she ran and jumped in Pastor John's arms, and the parents walked over, and they talked for a while, and he just kind of held her, and it was so sweet. And um, that night I had a dream, and in the dream, um, Pastor John was in heaven, and uh, in front of him was this field of, just went on forever, of yellow flowers. And, uh, and as J Pastor John stepped to the edge of the flowers, um, all of the flowers raised their heads, and it was the faces, smiling faces of all the kids he's ever taught. And um, praise God. That, that was John's, that's John's legacy, and it's precious. And, uh, and I'm thankful for a legacy as well. And, you know, you may not have the legacy of a big field like that, but maybe you have a little garden. But, you know, I, I'd like to see you have the opportunity to continue to serve and strong, finish strong. You know, uh, even if you haven't been running the race that well, you know, it, it's how you end the race. So, so let's become strong. Let's look for ways to serve and get to know families. You can talk to me. You can call the church, uh, see Dorothy. There's places for you to serve, places for you to be involved. You have value to the kingdom, and you have value to this church.